This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome a returning guest back to the show. That is Taylor St. Germain with ITR Economics. He's an economic analyst there. And Taylor, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. So the housing market, cyclical markets, uh, the high-flying cyclical markets, definitely experiencing a correction. And I think that's probably a few years overdue. So I think it's healthy. Interest rates were going up at the time that correction started to get pretty significant. But now rates have come back down again. Uh, Is that good news for these markets or is it not enough? Are they just overpriced and and there needs to be a correction? It is certainly good news for the markets. Our expectation when we look at housing starts, so we look at single family and multifamily housing starts, those are the series that we forecast here. When we look at the year over year rate of change for those starts, it is slowing in both single and multifamily starts. So even though we did get a back off of interest rate hikes from the Fed, uh, of course, we know mortgage rates correlate very well there. That'll help, but we're still expecting to see some weakness as we move further into the second half of this year and certainly the first half of next year. And that's largely driven by the price of homes. So the average home price now is much higher than even the level we were at before 2008, 2009 sure. occurred. What I think you were alluding to there is that the Fed doesn't directly control mortgage rates, but obviously they influence them. So those are uh, connected. And, you know, Taylor, it's always been interesting to me how very few economists, prognosticators out there, very few of them talk about housing payments. They always talk about housing prices. And then Mm -hmm. they do mention mortgage rates, as we did starting off this interview. But people buy a, a house on a payment, not a price. And that's what's interesting. You know, if you look back years ago and pick any period you want, You could pick a period where rates were high and prices were low, but the payment was the same as it is today, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I I think really there's got to be a lot more focus on housing payments. You know, what is the median mortgage payment? You know, and is that the apples to apples house that you would buy years ago for that payment? So. Anyway, Mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I certainly agree. And, you know, we look at, we we do boil it down to some similar metrics. So one metric we often look at here at ITR is household income needed to afford an average home in the region. So Mm -hmm. breaking it down and looking at some different statistics, and you can certainly see when you break it down to that level, why there are some pockets of the economy in terms of housing that are still doing very well, because just the average income needed to afford a home is so much lower in places like the Midwest, some of those states like down in the Southeast, like the Carolinas and Missouri, compared to an area like California, where you need just $135,000 in a household income to afford an average home, which is quite high. That, yeah, that's just absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, and, 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 you know, it would be worth it if the quality of life were actually better. And I, I always have been puzzled by this dichotomy of, you know, you pay more, but you don't necessarily get more. You know, there's the old saying, you get what you pay for. Well, that's not really true all the time. No, certainly not. It's in, of course, taxes have an impact on that as yeah. well. Yeah, no question. You know, I'm glad you brought up taxes because the SALT taxes, the state and local taxes, part of the new tax plan, has that really affected these expensive, higher-end cyclical markets? And they really don't have to be that high-end because if they're limited to $10,000 a year, you could have a property that's not even that expensive and it would still hurt you that you wouldn't be getting to take all your deduction as you did previously. Mm -hmm. I think it's a contributing factor. I don't think it's the only thing. You know, we talked about just some of the general economic trends that are having some downside pressure on the market. But I do think it is making an impact. When I look at our luxury home data sets and the different data that's come in, in just a six-month period of time, we've seen a complete trend reversal in U.S. luxury 
housing home sales. What I mean by a trend reversal is we went from an accelerating trend to a pretty sharp decelerating trend in the rate of change in just a six month period of time. So it was a pretty big swing. And I think salt is having an impact on that, but I don't think that's the only factor. I think housing prices and some of those um, general economic factors are having a bigger impact. What about, you know, incomes? I mean, for the first time in really about 41 years, Americans have finally experienced a real dollar raise in constant dollars. And and that's pretty incredible. But again, that probably doesn't even make much difference for the higher end cyclical markets around the country. And when we talk about those, we're talking about South Florida, the expensive northeastern markets, and really most of the West Coast. Absolutely. And we have seen areas um, like the Southeast, you're still getting some from very positive data coming out of the housing market in some of those regions. So I think that is making an impact. But even though we've seen some of these salaries and, and median wages increasing finally, and we didn't get that wage inflation really through the first half of this decade, we're still going through this cycle as an overall economy, and we still expect to slow down. So I think it helps to have a few extra dollars in our pocket. We certainly see that with the retail sales data at record highs, but I'm not seeing a large enough impact that would really change any type of trend or forecast that we have in place. Okay, so a general slowdown, not hugely significant, not a crash, but tell us about the slowdown. Why is the economy slowing? Yeah, absolutely. And first, I just want to unpack that a little more. We look at two different data sets when we talk about benchmarking for all economy. So of course, we look at US GDP, and we're seeing retail sales slowing. We're starting to see some of our consumer driven indicators slowing and certainly global activity in our some of our major trading partners are slowing down. So we expect that all to contribute to the GDP slowdown later this year. But no recession expected in our forecast for GDP at this time. Of course, we'll put an asterisk there because we got to certainly watch this tariff situation that we have going on. But at this point, we're not expecting a GDP recession. So that's the first expectation. Expect GDP to slow into the first half of next year, but we're not expecting any real period, two quarters of contraction to get us a recession. However, on the industrial side of the economy, we look at U.S. industrial production, which is another major benchmark for us. And that looks more at the utilities, mining, and manufacturing section of the economy. And we are expecting to see a little more weakness in the manufacturing side of the economy than what we're expecting for overall GDP. So for those of you out there that are in the non-residential construction, in the manufacturing sectors, we do expect to see a slowdown as we move into that 2020 timeframe. That's more pronounced than what we're seeing in overall GDP. Yeah, yeah. And when that relates to the housing market, can you, Taylor, have a slowdown in housing volume that doesn't mean a decline in prices? Or do those two always go together? No, I I wouldn't say they always go together. And and we might get a short period of price decline. But our expectation is that generally, as we move through the first half of this decade, that housing prices are going to continue on the trajectory they're on right now. We expect both from a business and personal investment side that the housing market is a pretty positive place to be, even though we're expecting a mild slowdown this year. The slowdown is so mild. Just to put it in perspective for you, our year-end expectation is about 2% contraction Mm year-over-year for single-family housing. That was almost 50% in 08-09. So just put that in perspective. 2% price contraction? No, that's overall housing starts. Okay, we so, don't so forecast. Starts. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we don't forecast housing prices specifically. We have tracked that. Of course, certainly something we track. And right now, um, we're at about two hundred seventy thousand on average home prices, and we would expect that to continue as we move into the next half of the twenty twenties. Okay. Tell me, you've mentioned housing starts quite a few times, and maybe it was off air as we talked for just a couple minutes before we started. But why are housing starts so significant? Tell us about that. As in, why do we look at housing starts? For yeah, I mean, I know it's a it's a barometer of the overall economy, developer mm-hmm. optimism of bankers financing deals, investors financing deals, whether it be mm-hmm. debt or equity. So talk to us about housing starts. I mean, of course, you know, it, it means a bunch of construction jobs, a bunch of uh, material pulled through the supply chain. So obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, building is a huge stimulative effect to the economy. Just from a high level, the first reason we look at housing starts is, of course, as a benchmark of activity for the overall economy. So the activity in the housing market 
tends to lead the general economy in terms of GDP and industrial production. That lead time can vary, but it's always a lead time rather than a lag time. When we look at non-residential construction, that tends to lag the overall economy. So that's the first reason. Just knowing where residential construction activity is headed is a good indication of where we're headed as an overall economy. And of course, we saw that in 08, 09, certainly. So that's the first reason. The second reason is by looking at housing starts, the way that data comes to us, we can look at a lot of different areas. We can look at that housing start data regionally. We can look at multi versus single family. So there's a lot of different ways we can break out that data and really get at what markets our clients are interested in. And those are large data series that we have a high degree of accuracy forecasting. So that's another main reason we leverage housing starts. Yeah, sure, sure. When you see a decline in housing starts, does that mean that if you project that out a few years later, you're going to have a shortage of inventory? You know, I think that's a case that we saw in 2008, 2009, of course, where, of course, that was in before 08, 09, that was a level that was just unsustainable. Now, how single family housing inventory, even though we're slowing down, we still don't have enough single family housing. So we're still working to get back to some higher levels of single family homes. On the multifamily side, though, that is a very high inventory levels right now. So those apartment buildings, those multifamily spaces, we expect to experience a more significant period of contraction rather than the 2% that we were expecting for single family. We're expecting below 9% contraction when you look at multifamily. And that is because of those high inventory levels and rising vacancy rates in these apartments. Yeah, the uh, class A apartments have really been overbuilt, haven't they? Absolutely. Yeah. And, And there are areas like the Southeast where That's proved to be okay because of the population growth those states are seeing. But for much of the Midwest, some of the states out West, they don't have that same supporting population to drive those multifamily starts higher. So sort of a a tale of the different regions when you look at the multifamily market. Yeah, and that's always the way it is. Look, all real estate is local. That's the thing everybody needs to understand. It's a pretty localized type of thing. I do think you can really categorize it by type. If you don't want to be overly local, you can look all around the planet and use three broad categories, linear, cyclical, and hybrid, and You know, that's going to tell you a lot. But of course, there's more to it than that, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. What I was getting at when I asked you about housing sale volume, and then you talked about housing starts and prices not being directly correlated. I wanted to dive into the, and I'm not going to call it what everybody calls it, the trade war. I'm going to call it the trade negotiation, (laughs) okay, because that's really what it is. But in the trade negotiation, (laughs) you know, when you have tariffs on imported products coming into the U.S., that means everybody's got to pay more for those products. And maybe they onshore their orders again and Instead of ordering uh, locks and fixtures and materials, building materials from overseas, they're ordering American products, which are more expensive. So either way, if you're a home builder, you got to pay more for your raw materials, right? Absolutely. And And we saw that certainly with that first round of tariffs that was put in place, focusing on steel and aluminum, of course, those are two very important input costs for the construction manufacturing industries. And as a result, we did get some inflation, which we were expecting to see. But we saw a lot of price increases that were a little higher than what you would expect out of a typical price increase for the year. And that was to offset some of the costs that were coming from tariffs. So mm-hmm. we saw it in two areas. Either you eat that cost of the higher input and take that against your margins, or we're going to pass those along to our customers. And we saw a lot of businesses choosing to pass along those price increases to their customers. So that's something that we should expect, especially if we see more tariffs putting in place, those price increases passed along. Yeah. I mean, how significant is that? You know, it begs the question, when a builder builds a new home, how much of that home is imported, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. And how much of it is subject to tariffs? Is it half? Is it 25%? And then what's the tariff amount? And then you know what's going to happen to housing prices from that perspective. You don't know overall because that depends on interest rates and the market and the economy in general. But, Mm -hmm. you know, for pure construction cost, 
that's a big deal, right? It certainly is. And that's where our concern comes in with the tariffs. Um, we certainly don't get political as a firm here. That's just not our space to play into. But there's winners and losers in this tariff situation. And I think people really need to understand that this isn't a one size fits all. It sort of depends where you fall into this equation. For some people that are manufacturing this stainless steel, this, these tariffs are great. And you know, there's a lot of people out there that believe that we need to continue to renegotiate these deals. But if you're on the flip side, and some of these products that are having tariffs placed on them are inputs for you, that's going to increase your costs. And you need to pass that along to your customers in order to protect your margins. And as that works down to the U.S. consumer, that's really where the concern among economists comes in. How far can we push before we start negatively hurting all of our businesses and consumers here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's the answer to that? And do, do you have any data or, you know, to answer that other question of how much of a home is subject to tariffs? Like, here's maybe a good way to look at it. If everything stays the same, in other words, the interest rates don't change, the economy doesn't change, and you simply have in isolation tariffs, and builders have to pay more for the raw materials. How much does that increase the price of a home? It's a great question, and I'm not sure what the exact number is. I guess the best example I could give you is just when I have a construction client, and this is a, a, a real example from one of my clients, typically they would increase their prices about 3%, and those price increases would come twice a year. Mm -hmm. Last year, due to the tariff and aluminum tariffs, we saw three price increases rather than two. So we saw an extra price increase. And those price increases were up in the range of 5% instead of 3%. Are you talking about for the whole year or are you talking about three times five, 15%? I mean, roughly, obviously. It's right. And it, that, that was certainly the case in some situations where we had between 10 and 15% increases in prices if you were to compound them over the year. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's pretty significant. The one thing I want to mention is that's not all. I think a couple of price increases could have offset the tariffs, but that's the other thing these tariffs have given us the avenue to do is increase our prices and fall back and use those tariffs as an excuse, even if we've already had those costs covered. We're also seeing businesses sort of take advantage of this tariff situation to benefit their margins as well. You mean, they're, are they using it as an excuse to raise prices? Is that what you mean? They certainly are. Yeah, <laughs> they're hiding behind it. Even if you're a business, and say you're a home builder, in the example we've been using, and you have a ton of raw material inventory in a storage warehouse, so mm -hmm. the tariffs don't even affect you. I mean, we saw this years ago with Southwest Airlines, when oil prices went through the roof, and of course that affects jet fuel prices ultimately, they bought futures and so they locked in cheap fuel and all the other airlines had to pay more it was like a brilliant move by southwest and mm -hmm. so their margins just totally increased because all their competitors were increasing prices and they were keeping their costs the same as everybody else had to increase due to the rising fuel cost so that was mm -hmm. really good treasury management right on their part and so say you're a home builder and you either have futures contracts on the commodities the raw materials or you just have a bunch of them in storage and in physical form so the tariffs actually don't affect you say you've got a one-year supply but you can raise your prices as an excuse right and use the tariffs eh, it's the tariffs so we got to raise prices right <laughs> it is or or you can do what many of some of the other end of the spectrum was doing which is keep your prices low and, and go after that market share right yeah you can increase market share or raise margins either way so mm -hmm. either way exactly. you're, you're going to win the game but it's a pretty interesting thing so you know what's your overall outlook and are there any questions i didn't ask you that you just you know things you want to share with our audience just to piggyback on the end of our, our tariff conversation, our overall view is is that the if we see more tariffs being put in place, that's a downside risk to our forecast. So I, I just want to reiterate for that to everyone out there who's there's a lot of uncertainty due to tariffs. I don't know what the current administration is going to do. If I did, I'd, I'd be a very wealthy man. But just look at those more tariffs as, as a downside risk, maybe hinting at a recession coming our way in 2020 if we see a very large dollar amount. We'll certainly keep you updated and evaluate then. But just plan for a slower economy later this year. That's CapEx. That's industrial production. That's GDP. The indicators we look at, they're slowing down. They've already turned over. So start to think about your cash position. Start to um, 
just get ready for a lower level of activity compared to what we've seen in years prior. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the economy has been on a tear for years. Things have been booming. (laughs) You know, how much of an adjustment are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we look at U.S. industrial production, we're only expecting about a, a very mild period of contraction. Really, the first two quarters of 2020 is where we expect that weak point to be. But by the second half of the year, we're going to be accelerating in the pace of rise once again. So right. it's and, really just yeah. uh, the next four to five quarters. We expect to feel that weakness, but we'll recover quickly and expect 2021 especially to be another great time to be in business here in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, obviously, it'll be an election year in 2020. So that'll be, uh, make it even more interesting, won't it? <laughs> oh, there's just more fun to be had, that's for sure. That is for sure. One interesting thing about this, just as we wrap it up here, is something has to give. And a lot of people ask, well, okay, so if the economy cools off a bit and these tariffs cause prices of homes to increase, and by the way, real estate investors, if new home prices increase and you already own existing properties, that puts upward pressure on your prices too, because it's just a competitive market. Buyers look at new homes, they look at resale homes, they look at continuing to be renters as maybe they're priced out of the market, uh, and they've got to stay in the rental pool. So overall, investors win any which way you slice it there. Mm-hmm. But but the interesting thing is, is that a lot of people don't understand that ultimately lifestyle is where, you know, that's the thing that where you take a a bite out of it, right? The lifestyle has to contract. If you have higher cost for home builders, if you have higher interest rates or a slowing economy, people just don't get to live in the same house they might have lived in previously or been able to afford to live in. So, you know, The square footage declines, the density increases, the quality declines, the neighborhood declines. Something has to happen. Something has to give. And usually it's just overall standard of living. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, in this downturn, we're not expecting to see something that's going to really alter the way of life. It's, it's so mild and you no know, return so quick. But that's certainly true when, when we look at previous recessions. It's it not only has an impact on prices and, and what goes on in the market, but also just the way people are living, their personal expenses and, and how much money they're willing to throw at, at a new home. And it might keep them in their existing home for a little while longer. Yeah, yeah. so if they're already renting, they might just keep on renting or they'll be buying a smaller house. Taylor, uh, give out your website. Tell people where they can find out more about ITR. Go to itreconomics.com. Uh, great website to give you some more information about our consulting services, the different forecasts and tools that we can help you, you all out with out there. So please check out itreconomics.com and contact us with, with any economic questions you may have. I'm more than happy to help. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.